uh, thank you for joining us. This is a special live uh, streaming version, unprepared, spontaneous, of The Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long. Uh, Shepherd's Voice with Dave Long is exclusively seen on the YouTube channel. And uh, this will be archived later. I'm also simultaneously <laughs> recording this <laughs> so, so you can see how a total <clears throat> uh, mess is made. Let's see. Yes, we are streaming and we are recording. So if the streaming doesn't look and sound too good, we're going to put this up. Uh, uh, we're going to record it and throw it up to the uh, screen that way. Boy, that's uh, Sermon Desk Camera is on and live. We're going to call this Seek God. And uh, the purpose of this, an extremely important message that could have helped me out many years ago. Um, and I just wanted to keep this short. This isn't going to be real long. But it's spontaneous and uh, it's being done immediately because I feel the message is possibly one of the most important messages you will ever hear as far as any kind of a sermon or a word from uh, a pulpit or from a person who seeks God and uh, reads the Bible and the Lord impressed on me he said you know I was ruminating today about how much this knowledge that I'm about to give you would have helped me out 37 years ago if you want to know the exact amount of time a key point in my life when I was making a decision as to about what to do no man could help me in the decision I got no proper answer from man and if I was seeking God at the time I I didn't get an answer that I should have gotten I am thinking and basically it comes down to this it's one thing to be a worldly person and to be having your plans for success what you want to do for a living you know and then okay I'll go to this take this major in college or I'll go to this trade school I'll come out and do this I'll get a wife and 3.7 kids I'll have a couple dogs and a cat get married get a house you know and then the normal American dream of what people do after they finish working when they're oh 65 is their house is paid off the kids are out of the house they take a few vacations you know they enjoy themselves a little bit somebody gets critically ill they move into a nursing home and they die <laughs> then <laughs> the medical industry and the, and the funeral homes get the rest of their money that's basically the American dream <laughs> am I am I lying to you am I not telling you the absolute truth okay so anyway, <clears throat> let's let's tilt this down a little bit, so it's not so much the Stephen Hawking angle, you know, ALS victim, uh, the late great Stephen Hawking. I was a big fan of him, quantum mechanics, physics, and, and you people who watch the Big Bang Theory and all that can relate. Okay, so what I'm telling you today, you may have come here seeking advice on your way in life and wanting to know what to do you're at a critical point in your life okay I was in a Bible college and I had just finished having two not one but two personal encounter visions with Jesus Christ that year my sophomore year at Southeastern now Southeastern University in Lakeland Florida first time I saw him was in the Bush Chapel doing a communion service in the morning and then six months later April as a matter of fact of 1982 he uh, he spoke to me and once you hear his voice you see him and you hear his voice there is no reproducing his voice if you hear the voice of Jesus Christ you will forevermore know him when he speaks he truly has a a unique voice I won't go into that detail now because uh, <clears throat> I'm not here to talk about the visions but I'm talking about seeking him for wisdom for direction at critical key moments in your life and 
let me give you the background of where I was working from. Okay, I had spent two years at a Lutheran college in political science major. Then uh, I was about to spend two years at a Methodist college in a religion major, and I was just finishing up two years of college in a ministry major at uh, what is now Southeastern University. And uh, <clears throat> I was unhappy with what they were teaching. I was raised, born and raised a Lutheran. <laughs> born a Lutheran, you know. When you get your birth certificate, they also give you a certificate of membership to the Lutheran church your parents go to. Anyway, my father was a Lutheran pastor. You may know that from me telling you that in the past. We did everything as Lutheran as you can be. I was in the choir. I was an acolyte. I went to the Boy Scout troop that was at that Lutheran church. I was in the Luther League. We had a summer home in a Lutheran association. And Millenburg College, which was my first college, was a Lutheran college. So <laughs> Martin Luther would have been past proud. Now there is a Lutheran indeed. Okay. So then I went into the Assembly of God and acknowledged many of their their doctrines and their teachings are spot on. They are right out of the New Testament. There is no argumentation with them. Uh, in the summer of 1982, I think it was, I went before the Northeastern Synod Presbytery Board of the Lutheran Church in America for uh, getting an approval to be... Uh, uh, named a candidate uh, for uh, for their you know going into their seminary and then being approved to go into their churches and they had already picked out a church for me to assume after getting out of seminary because uh, I was pretty advanced in my education at Southeastern University so they still wanted me to go through the Lutheran seminary which was four years but uh, they wanted to see if my views as a Pentecostal, born-again, spirit-filled Lutheran were different from their views, uh, from them having no uh, alliances with the Assembly of God or the Pentecostal churches. And I had also been a member of Baptist churches, <coughs> Lutheran, Assembly of God, Methodist, and Baptist churches. I had attended for serious periods of time and uh, went of course to a Lutheran and Assembly of God and a Methodist college never went to a Baptist college but Kenneth E. Hagan who wrote many many books Dr. Kenneth E. Hagan who died in 2003 and also started Rama University in Tulsa, Oklahoma he, uh, he was born well he was raised a Baptist and was a Baptist preacher till he got spirit felled and they kicked him out Okay, so I came from uh, a mutt, <laughs> mongrel affiliation of uh, uh, denominations and beliefs. And basically, I believe the Bible. I believe what's in the New Testament and in the Bible. If it's not in there, I don't believe it. I don't get along with New Age mixers who like to mix in some of the Hindu and Buddhist philosophies. I do not get along with people who go against the Bible who uh, prefer traditions of America or modern traditions that are popular in uh, large mega churches. Um, and I am not specifically knocking prosperity, okay? I am. I know God wants us to prosper. I wish among all things that you may prosper and be in good health even as your soul does prosper. And uh, <clears throat> if you want to start reading the Bible, you see, God told me, just just go on, I'll fill your mouth. I said, I don't have anything. Usually I have 10 to 15 pages typed up, single space, ready to go before I do one of these. And he said, uh, just just have faith. Just turn it on and start speaking. And, I'll, and the son of a gun, <clears throat> I hope this doesn't run too long. I wanted to keep this short. <laughs> Whatever the spirit wants to do. Okay, but these ideas are rolling into my head and these thoughts and things you should know. And specifically, this sermon, this uh, little meditation that I'm giving to you, I'm not backing it up with a lot of scripture because 
I haven't done the scripture research, but I know it's right out of scripture. I mean, uh, Old Testament, New Testament. If you've been a Christian for any amount of decades at all, you're, the things I'm saying now will resonate with you. Okay. <clears throat> I reached this critical point in my life when I realized that some of the things that the Assembly of God was teaching were not, in my opinion, to be found in the New Testament. And they were kind of manipulative, controlling uh, beliefs. And they said, well, you either believe these beliefs or get out of our denomination. And uh, they were small things in some people's sight. But I believed God was an absolute God. And there's no black, there's, there's black and white. There's no gray in God's doctrines. I mean, you either believe the word of God or you don't. And I can't understand it to this day how we could have 3,000 denominations out there. We have one Bible. There's many different versions of the Bible, but they all basically say the same things, except in very minute uh, things. Occasionally, there'll be, uh, there'll be something in the New International Version or the King James or the New Living Translation or the New English Bible that I'm not totally on board with. But if you look around, on some of those controversial verses, most of the other translations will say the same thing in in an area. They'll all jump on basically the same thing. Uh, the Bram Study Bible is a very good Bible too that I like. <clears throat> so I read I read a lot online. A lot of my theological preparatory library was destroyed by my oldest brother um, when he. Uh, it should be premon. I, I should pre pre prepare you in this that he was not, uh, in my opinion, operating on the Christian side of things, and he has to this day extreme great hatred of me and uh, vengeance and uh, personally my own personal assessment of the situation is that he's a Satan worshiper. He's gone over to the dark side. He's not a Christian, and he's totally possessed by demons. So for those of you who believe in demon possession and people who have given themselves over to the dark side, uh, the thief comes not but to steal, kill, and destroy. Well, this guy is the king of stealing, killing, and destroying. And whenever he's been able to get a hold of some of my stuff, he has done exactly that. And that that's my way of telling you I've probably lost thousands of dollars of my theological background books that I had in my mobile home in Jacksonville and Lakeland, Florida. Uh, those books are never seen again. And, uh, you know, at the time, I was told by the family, oh, all your stuff is safe. Uh, you're, and my mother told me this over the phone. I was in Pennsylvania taking care of affairs up here after Dad died for the family. And... Uh, she said, all your stuff, we sold the trailer, but all the stuff that was in there, uh, we have in a storage locker. She said, I think your oldest brother has that in a storage rental place. I said, well, you know, too bad about the house, but I didn't pay for it anyhow. That was a gift from my father and mother <clears throat> when I was uh, down in Bible college. And after I got out of there to locate in Lakeland, Florida, and anyway, uh, uh, I lost all my notes that were in there. I had my textbooks and, and all my notes from all those classes of all those years. Uh, Millenburg College, uh, Florida Southern, and Southeastern College, they're, they're all gone. I was out of all those schools by 1985. <clears throat> and I started a uh, career as a radio disc jockey. And uh, some other things I won't go into right now. This is not my resume either. I'm here to give you wisdom about seeking God. First of all, for you people who aren't Pentecostals, didn't, weren't brought up in an Assembly of God or Church of God type of denomination in which you're told you can have an intimate relationship with the living God and with Jesus Christ, which I never knew till, oh, uh, let's say a few years ago. 
Uh, I've lived my almost my entire life without knowing, you know what, it's okay to go seek God. <laughs> You're not bothering him. He actually wants you to bug him daily and talk to you, talk to him about what what do you need, what what do you want, or what does he want, and he wants to talk back to you. And when it comes down to important decisions in life that will change the rest of your life and your destiny and your fortunes and who you meet and marry or not and and where you live and what job you do for a vocation and and you know how you're going to fare as far as who you're going to marry and how many kids you're going to have and all that big important stuff seek god ask god ask him for direction let him go to his throne room and ask him what he wants you to do and to give you direction and seek him in these things and you know what as a lutheran minister's kid growing up who's never ever told that if you have a question about something you don't know what to do go seek god <laughs> pray to god and see what he tells you to do now the assemblies of god will get down pretty hard and say oh we always tell all our people that if you're making an important decision, seek God. Well, they're they're lying <laughs> because uh, I went to their churches and uh, before Southeastern and after Southeastern. Uh, oh, gee, I attended. I started attending AG churches in 1978, and uh, I was in an AG church last year <laughs> for a few Sundays before I couldn't handle it anymore and got out because the hypocrisy the the ministry uh, the senior pastor and junior pastor which was his son uh, 501c3 was saying one thing and then you know you uh, actually went to have them put that into practice in your behalf doesn't matter whether it's you know personal counseling or or a prayer or bringing up situations they just blow you off they don't have any time for you I mean, his pizza was getting cold. It was 12 o'clock noon, time to lock up the church. See you next week. Good luck catching me, you know. So, and they had their little rock show. I'll tell you, there's a church near me. It's supposed to be Assembly of God. I don't know if it is. It's independent, 501c3, but they use their materials. It used to be AG. I think they went independent, and the reason why they canned the denomination is because now they have a half hour little rock show where a technically perfect little band sings and plays very well it's like going to a nightclub and seeing a cover band do some of your favorite rock songs and you know it's it's hard to follow because who goes to a bar and tries to sing along with a cover band that's doing rock and roll have you ever tried to sing steve perry <laughs> it's impossible have you ever tried to sing like you know, uh, lead singers for <laughs> Leonard Skinner or any anybody, you know, even the Beatles. Uh, if you don't have their voice, that's why they, they write four-part harmony in church hymns so that you can pick one of those vocal parts and stumble along and at least try to participate in worshiping God. Anyway, so the people basically go there and see a performance for half an hour by uh, a Christian band and you can't sing along they put the words up on the screen but you don't have that kind of a voice range to be able to screech out like steve perry of journey for everybody who remembers him or you know i don't i don't know katie perry <laughs> contemporaries and millennials you know female voice ranges uh, sorry, guys aren't going to be jumping in there <laughs> on the praise and worship session <laughs> with female range voiced uh, singing. And uh, that's one of the many problems in the modern church. Okay, so, and then they, then after the half hour of the little show, the little rock show of modern Christian rock music, um, they trot out the, the offering and they have a two-minute prayer and uh, you know bless everybody here today <laughs> amen God <laughs> so much for intensely seeking the Lord and then then the pastor comes up with the sermon which is usually like a four or six part segment you know they they go they drag it over a series of six or eight weeks on one dusty historic topic in the Old Testament 
and they go to the ancient ancient archaeology books and and they dig around in the original uh, atmosphere of what was going on back then in the culture and they it, you feel like you're being lectured in a university by a professor who's teaching ancient religion and you know that you've had your rock show and then you have your sermon on ancient religions and then they get rid of you and they throw you out of the church for another week after you're supposed to give 10 percent of your income to them <laughs> fat chance anyway so enough enough about my my problems with the assembly of god uh but it's doctrinal my differences are okay one thing small thing minor thing they say the first initial evidence of praying and or of being baptized in the holy spirit that is you don't have the full filling of the holy spirit in you unless you speak in tongues well, you know what? If somebody raises the dead or somebody prophesies with God inside of them speaking things that are unknown or any other gifts, that one of the nine gifts of the Holy Spirit that are delineated uh, in Corinthians and, and, and you're going to tell me that person's not spirit-filled just because he doesn't speak in tongues? That's <laughs> horseradish. <laughs> You know it, and I know it. If somebody's operating under the power of God, in one of the power gifts, or the miracle gifts, or the word of knowledge gifts, I don't care if they're speaking in tongues or not. I'm listening. If if a person is praying over people who are deaf, and they get their hearing back, or they're blind, and they can see again, I'm going to be in that guy's church. If he's local, I'm going to go there, and I'm going to listen to what he has to say. So that's a minor thing. Now, I do speak in tongues. Okay, so I acknowledge having the baptism in the Holy Spirit, the filling of the Holy Spirit, whatever you want to call it. And uh, I speak in tongues. So according to the Assembly of God, I am officially baptized and filled with the Holy Spirit. Um, but you know, the great commission of Jesus Christ was go into all the world and preach the gospel to all the nations. And as you go... He said, heal the sick, raise the dead, cleanse the lepers, and cast out the demons. Okay, now if you're healing the sick, raising the dead, cleansing the lepers, or casting out demons, I'm going to give it to you that your spirit failed. <laughs> Jesus Christ lives inside of you because no mortal man can heal sickness, can raise dead people, can cast out a demon or can cleanse a leper Jesus does that he's the one who can do that and uh, we've gotten very dangerous in recent decades in America we've had an easy grace gospel preached and I'm not in the same <sighs> there are some radical guys who have radical books very harsh speaking books on this subject of easy grace you know there's one ditch and there's the other ditch. There's the left and the right sides of the road. Um, and uh, I think we got into a very dangerous period of time here with, uh, with America, with Christians in America, because basically we were told, don't sweat it. Jesus took care of all of your sins. You know you can't live a holy life anyhow. You're going to sin every day, which, you know what, I basically believe that. Uh, anybody who thinks they can go a whole day without one sin before God is delusional. Because if you walk down the street and you have an ill thought towards another person, maybe a sworn enemy who hates your guts, that's a sin. If you get up in the morning and there's something that you should do and you don't do, or you do it late or something, you know, the seemingly minor stuff is still sin. So don't tell me that you're walking perfectly and holy before God. You're not. But there's that, and there's opening up the floodgates. There's not trying at all and just saying, you know what, I, I can't walk holy before God. I'm not holy. I'm just, we're rotten in our inner core, which is technically not true, theologically not true, because if you're really born again, your spirit is new. Your mind doesn't know what's going on yet, but the spirit man inside of you 
is of God and of God's creation. And we went down a very rocky, dangerous road uh, with... I love Joseph Prince. I've listened to him. I was caught up in his teaching in the 90s. I believe it was the 90s or the early 2000s and got some of his books. And I just have to say... Uh, he's he's tried to come back and retrench from his original positions because I believe he realized what he did and uh, what he was saying. But he was trying to tell people, relax. You know, you're too uptight and worried about your sins. Jesus took care of them all. He loves you. All you have to do is get born again. A little sprinkle a little pixie dust, you know, a little pixie dust over you. You, you walk the uh, sawdust trail up the front of your assembly god church you say the little fat five minute prayer that the pastor speaks first and you parrot him you know oh god i'm a sinner i have many i'm sorry for my sins please save me you know if you've never been to an assembly to a church that that has an altar call the first of all the king of doing this the king of altar calls is the baptist church Nobody does elder calls like the Baptist Church. And you can get saved every Sunday <laughs> at Baptist Church. You know, because they'll, they'll put it out there, boy. They'll, that'll be the last 10, 15 minutes of the service. Everybody out. You know, if you knew Mil Billy Graham. Billy Graham was a Baptist, wasn't he? That was his denomination. And Billy Graham, uh, his, half his sermon was <laughs> the altar call. You know, and everybody had this impression. Well, this is it. It's the magic moment. You go down there and you repeat this. You parrot this five-minute prayer and you're saved. You know what? Ain't in the Bible, folks. Nowhere in the New Testament did Jesus give an altar call at the end of his teachings in the Sermon on the Mount say, Okay, now everybody here who knows they're a sinner, I want you to come down front right now and repeat a prayer that I'm going to pray over you and you're going to pray it in my name and after I die and rise from the dead you're in good shape you know and as if the 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 thing you come away from the altar with is and after that it's it's all good doesn't matter what I do I'm saved I acknowledged and mentally ascended to, that Jesus Christ is God come to earth and died for my sins and rose from the dead and is now in heaven and uh, you know I can do whatever I want to till I'm dead <laughs> because he paid for it and uh there are churches out there that are saying exactly that and uh you pastors listening you know who you are <laughs> you know like uh i'm not throwing any stones here because i have my own glass walls on my house and uh that's the case for all the pastors but our topic here was seeking god and getting it through to you that, you know what, um, if you're at a major decision point in your life as touching your eternal destiny with God or the devil, you know, concerning heaven and hell, Jesus and Satan, uh, seek God. <laughs> if it concerns who you're going to marry, probably the second most important decision in your life next to your eternal destiny is who do you hook up with and live with for the rest of your life as your partner and support and companion? Seek God. Don't enter into a relationship with a woman, guys, or with a, with a man, girls, unless you've sought God about it and said, what do you think, Holy Spirit? Is this one okay? You know, and really gone in there and sought the Lord about it. And then after that, I guess, you know, after... The eternal equation and then your marriage destiny then it would be your vocation go god what am i supposed to do on this planet for the next 40 years what am i doing here what do you want me to do on this planet that's a very important question um <clears throat> one that i never put before god ever because as a lutheran i was told well you know just do something anything as my father a doctorate of Lutheran theology went to Mount Airy Seminary in Philadelphia Pennsylvania and uh, and had his master's and then he got his doctorate many years later uh, in theology and his advice to me as his son 
of a pastor of 2,500 people who are Lutherans was, uh, I said to Dad, what should I do for a living? He said, anything. <laughs> just something. Just get a job. Give her, earn money. He said, is that how God would talk to his beloved people? Is that how God would advise his uh, beloved sons and daughters on planet Earth? No. No, that's not God at all. He's got something for you. He's got a path. He's got a destiny. He's got a life he wants you to walk out and live because it's going to bless you. And it's where your passions are and your abilities. And it's what he's designed you for. And key things are going to happen if you go down that path. And if you don't go down that path, you're going to miss out. And a lot of people on this planet that you were supposed to be there for, they're going to miss out too. I know a specific person. I won't tell you who he is. And I won't tell you how I know him. But let me just say that many years ago, again, he was at a one of these transitional points in life. And he was thinking, should I stay where I am or should I move down to Florida? And he was looking around down in Florida, but obviously not prayerfully and asking God about it. And decided to come back to this state and live here. Instead of going to Florida and living there, uh, and <clears throat> there was a major, large church down there that was the center of Christian Jesus movement in the 1980s in Lakeland, Florida, that had 10,000 members. And they had the world's top Christian speakers and ministers and music groups coming through and speaking and, and singing and, and praising and worshiping in this church. Very important church. Uh, it lacked key wisdom and leadership, this church. And uh, <clears throat> this person went on to start churches in Pennsylvania, but they're small and they're in the middle of nowhere and they have few members. And most of, mostly his money founded these churches. I believe, had this man sought God and heard for wisdom from God, I've felt this in my spirit many times over the past few years, he would have gone to this Lakeland, Florida church. It's gone now. They went bankrupt. They split. The church had division. Uh, they split up. They couldn't make the monthly bills. They were sold in bankruptcy twice. The, the church denomination that bought them couldn't make a go of it either. And the place, w the land was sold, uh, probably a $30 million building, went for $2 million bucks. They bulldozed the place and took it down. You can't even see where the church, where it was. And it was built brand new, 1985, at a, at a cost of only like $10 million. But it was patterned after Radio City Music Hall in New York City. Uh, it had uh, the uh, hydraulic stage that would come up. It was, uh, I think, uh, 100 feet wide, which is the same width, I think, as Radio City Music Hall's hydraulic stage. They had just tremendous sound reinforcement in there. It was all engineered by JBL. They put in the amplifiers in the banks of crown amplifiers and rooms of air-conditioned amps and, and speakers behind the ceiling of the... Uh, s be behind the ceiling was all these uh, thousands and thousands of dollars of of uh, the best sound reinforcement equipment money could buy and uh, while I was there I, I saw acts like Sandy Patty Amy Grant um, Carmen and uh, the guy with the trumpet <laughs> you know back in the 80s if they were big they went to Carpenter's home church now there was a number of other things that occurred at Carpenter's, but I believe they lacked a kind of outside. They're basically run by the family, I think. The family was uh, it it led and directed the church, and the rest of the people on their council were kind of sycophantic uh, yes men. You know, I think that's what happened, and uh, stuff happened. And there weren't calmer, cooler heads there to keep it together. And I have no doubt it was the generals of hell 
got together and said, we got to stop this thing. we got to bring it down. And, you know, there was a number of revivals that were talked about through the decades as being huge. One of them took place right there in Lakeland, Florida, in that church. Rodney Howard Brown was there for three years, and he went on to the Toronto Blessing and the Pensacola thing, Revival. Uh, Brownsville, I don't see, was it the Brownsville? <coughs> There's a Brownsville Revival or something. Anyway, uh, key instrumental people. And uh, this could never have been God's will that this church was built for this expense and all this good stuff started happening and then for it to split, go bankrupt and be brought down to the ground. This is the devil's operation. And uh, it could have kindled something that would have sent out waves across this country and transformed at least the southeastern United States. Uh, so, you know, a matter of Boy, the decisions you make in your life can be extremely important. You might think you're nothing in the body of Christ. And, you know, what What do I have to offer? What do I have to offer? Oh, that's the way I felt back in the mid-80s. I was like, I'm at best a fifth wheel. The church doesn't need me. They don't need me in the ministry. Sure, I saw Jesus at, you know, my chapel in Lakeland, Florida. Sure. You know, uh, he gave me a specific direction. But I said, why? He's got this well and under control. Look at this church. This will be here. This carpenter's home church will be here for hundreds of years. It will stand here forever. This is a foundational. It will be like the big cathedrals in Europe. You know. And uh, we, you know, it's just so important. Uh, when we get little tiny directions from God. That we seek him and we go after what he wants us to do. You have no idea how important you are in the body of Christ until decades later when you see the dominoes that fall because you weren't there. You didn't supply your part of the body of Christ. You didn't do what you were called to do. So, you know, the message is on major decisions, whether it's about your eternal life and salvation whether it's about who you marry or whether it's about what you do for a living the big three you know what you do for a living to earn money you know what are you going to be a teacher pastor uh, uh, doctor lawyer actor entertainer singer songwriter you know who are you going to marry is uh, the girl that you're with right now is she it or does God have someone else and the girl you're with right now is from Satan and her idea is to knock you over and to make sure you never get into God's will uh, you know or so you've got your marriage thing and, and then of course you know if you're at the point where you're seeking God about what you should do about salvation you're probably already in a saved born again spirit felt person because worldly people don't do that they don't care <laughs> <laughs> you know, something has to get a hold of them. They have to be pushed into a church or prayed over in order to get involved in this whole United States Christian religion thing. And then once you do, okay, once you've got your your eternal life thing settled and you decided you believe in the Bible and Jesus and you've asked God about who to marry and he showed you the, the girl and, uh, you know, girls, he showed you the guy. And uh, LGBT people don't get upset with me, okay? I'm not doing any judgment here. I'm just following standard teaching in the Bible. <laughs> uh, God loves everybody. Yes, he does. He, he loves people that are walking outside the lines of the New Testament and the Old Testament and all that. And, uh, you know, he, he also loves people who are drunkards and uh, put down a little too much alcohol. People who eat a little too much. I mean, you people in the church that are getting up in arms and, and all judgy about other groups of people and their sins, <laughs> you want to you wanna touch something real touchy <laughs> in the Christian realm? Uh, mention weight and uh, eating and gluttony. <laughs> gluttony, 
eating <laughs> body weight. God said, I'm, <laughs> I will live inside of you. I will make you a temple of God, a temple of the Holy Ghost. He didn't say, build me a fallout shelter <laughs> that will survive a nuclear direct strike. <laughs> I mean, God bless you. I know, you know I'm, and you know what? I love the overweight people. And uh, as a matter of fact, I, I, uh, uh, there, I, I'm just pointing out. Everybody has their area, and probably that's the number one big problem in the Church of the United States today, as far as fleshly, earthly, sin type things. Okay, and 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 there's reasons I understand, and God lovingly, knowingly knows. There's good reasons why people might be 100 or 200 pounds overweight. They might have had just a, an abysmally horrible, dreadful, uh, terrorized childhood. Their life might have been exceedingly hard. You don't know the emotional, mental, verbal abuse they might have gone. They're, they're self-medicating. Everybody medicates somehow. Everybody has problems in their life. Everybody has an attack of the enemy against them. And you know what? Everybody deals with it somehow. They don't just ignore it. Some people drink excessively and use alcohol. Some people get into legal drugs. Some people use legal drugs. Some people work a lot. You know, workaholics. And some people watch television all day or game all day. Some people eat. They pick up cupcakes and and you know, uh, some people go after money. Some people Use sex for that. You know, the people who will, you get the dopamine rush high from from a physical orgasm. So it's very highly addictive. It's, it's like drug addiction. Um, so everybody's got their area. Nobody, everybody lives in a glass house. Nobody can throw stones. So that's just a long way of saying, okay, once you make up your mind about who Jesus Christ is, and then you gone to God about who should you marry and you said okay what should I do for a living what do you want me to do on this planet or you know even if you're my age uh, still at my age okay I'm cool with Jesus uh, as far as marrying somebody you know what right now I'm, I'm single um, I don't consider myself uh, well, the Bible officially considers me single, and let's just leave it at that. And uh, I'm not I'm not dating anybody per se, and it's not my chosen state. And this is because I missed one of those major life decision moments when you should seek God and ask Him what you're supposed to do. And I have been married and divorced, and that was in the 80s. And that girl. It was a disaster. She was definitely sent from hell. That is not a woman I should have been near or dating, let alone getting married to. But, you know, that's what I knew. And I did all that after being in Southeastern. So, you know, because what do they teach you in college or, you know, in church or in the churches I went to? What, what do they teach you about who you marry? They don't. They don't ever talk to you about that stuff. That's the important stuff in life that they ought to be talking about. They're talking to you about Jesus and the lambs and how he loves children. And you ought to go out and pet lambs and be nice and not swear or get get loud or, or nasty. Love everybody. La, la, la. You know. And the type of advice I got about love growing up was, well, when you meet the one, you'll know it. <laughs> how do you know you're in love? Well, you just do. You know, when you're in love, you'll know it's the right one. That's baloney. <laughs> it's a bunch of crap. And, uh, you know, same thing about uh, they don't thank God they don't handle Jesus that way and getting saved that way. If you're in a Baptist or a Pentecostal church or you're born into a family that's Baptist or Pentecostal, you are going to walk the aisle. You are going down that aisle and you are going to accept Jesus Christ or else. Because <laughs> I know those people. <laughs> I've been around those people. You know, those mamas don't take no for an answer <laughs> as far as Jesus goes. But, you know, if you're an Episcopalian or a Lutheran or 
a Baptist or, well, no, not Baptist, uh, you know, the main line denominations, Presbyterian, let's see, Episcopals, Presbyterians, UCCs, Reforms, Moravians, Lutherans, you know, on down the line. You know, churches, well, I'm going to let him make up his own mind because he's an intelligent being and I'll let him choose the religion he wants to be in, the denomination he wants to be in, right? So uh, that's the way we handle it in modern day America. You got down south the Baptists, hardcore standing on their kids' heads about you no good, dirty, rotten sinner, you need to get saved, stop doing your drugs and drinking alcohol and dating these bad women. And, you know, up in the northeastern United States, uh, well, we're into, you know, our sports, basketball and football and baseball. And, uh, yeah, church is this thing we do sometimes, a couple times a month on Sunday morning. We get it over with. We put in our ritual with Jesus or with God. And we get our little gold stars for being in a service. And then we move on and get back to real life. (laughs) And, of course, out there in California, they're all smoking pot anyhow and running from burning wildfires <laughs> and mudslides and earthquakes. So they don't have time to go to church at all. <laughs> no, I'm sorry. I, I kid the California people. Uh, there's some major mega churches in Los Angeles. I think Los Angeles has more mega churches than any other city in the country, believe it or not. And... Uh, uh, Oh, some of the big churches that are on TV, let's see, a lot of them are down in Texas. They like to do things in a big way in Texas. Kenneth Copeland Ministries is in Dallas, and uh, Jerry Savell Ministries, and let's see, Kenneth Hagen's headquartered in Oklahoma, and uh, you've got uh, some some people I really respect a whole lot. Uh, uh, James Maloney is in Dallas area. Uh, Curry Blake is in the Dallas area. Um, James Maloney and Curry Blake are two guys who have uh, done amazing things around the world with Jesus Christ. And and if you don't believe in miracles, Google them, look them up on YouTube, and watch them for a few hours. And, uh, boy, I buy everything they say. I, I don't think they're not... They are not kidding, folks. These guys are the real deal. If you want to know the cutting edge of Christianity on the planet today, it's, uh, you know what? My lighting is getting really weird. I apologize for doing this. I'm going to see if we can do this. Okay. And uh, maybe, no, that's not good. I like that. Okay. Let the camera software system do its thing to automatically correct for the sun's going down is what it is. It's almost 6 o'clock p.m. here in Pennsylvania in the woods. So, you know, the sun goes down and the light falls fast once it goes behind the trees. Anyway, uh, the topic is seek God for your important decisions in life. Don't let him out of it. And it's very important that you know what he wants you to do. So you say, Dave, how could you have been in an Assembly of God university training to be a pastor and made a critical decision to jump ship and get out of it, get out of that university without consulting God and transfer into Florida Southern College, Methodist College, and go into their religion major there? Well, I I wanted my own personal religious beliefs, Christian beliefs in the New Testament to be left alone. And uh, they won't do that to you at an Assembly of God college. They they will get all up in arms and editorialize about some of your favorite national ministers. And they were saying some very mean, nasty things in the classroom there about some of my favorite uh, Christian teachers who I could see in the Bible from front to back of the Bible, were lining up with the Bible. They weren't saying anything heretical or blasphemous. They were preaching the Bible. Some of the things that the Assembly of God has refused to embrace and indulge themselves in, such that uh, God does not want you to be dirt poor all your life, and that's not blessed. And you can go to God in times of need when you have big trouble in your life and ask him to help you out, and that's okay. 
And pretty much what I was getting from the AG pulpits back then, in my opinion, about my interpretation of what I was being taught was, uh, God is a holy and mighty sovereign God. And he can do anything he wants, anywhere he wants, anytime he wants. So, you know, sometimes God will send you through this or that or make you sick or tribulation or you, you might be poor. But whatever state you find yourself in, you know, it's God's will. God's behind it. He wouldn't let anything happen if it wasn't in his will. I hear this stuff out of Joel Osteen's pulpit. I hear Joel saying this. Remember, Joel Osteen never went to any kind of theological training. Never went to seminary. I hope he reads the Bible. I know he listens to Dr. Phil. <laughs> Obviously, that boy is listening to somebody in the world because he gives a lot of, uh, you know, advice that... Uh, sometimes he says things out of the pulpit I don't see scripture for. Yes, God is on our side. He's kind of a spur outshoot from the Joseph Prince ministry, easy grace type of school of philosophy. God loves everybody. Doesn't matter if you're Buddhist or Hindu. God loves you. You can be a Muslim and still go to heaven. You know, <clears throat> um, not going to get off into that tangent. How did we get there? Okay, the reason why I was getting out of Southeastern and transferring to Florida Southern is... They're poking around in my deep beliefs, my pillars of belief in Christianity in the New Testament. I see they are Bible verses. It's written in the New Testament. Jesus said it. I don't know why the Assembly of God or my professors have problems with what he's saying. So I decided, you know, there is, uh, uh, okay, they hated, let me just put it out there. My Assembly of God professors at Southeastern University in the 80s hated Kenneth Copeland and Kenneth Hagan. They, they roasted them and grilled them and served them up for dinner and lunch every day in their classrooms. They would just tell you that they're... I've heard these exact verbatim words. They said they're, they're blasphemous. They're blabbit and grabbit preachers. They are absolutely not doctrinal. They are heretics. There are devils going to hell, you know, and, and other nice things like that. And, you know, I had their books, and I read what they said. And Kenneth Hagin especially, every paragraph, if he says something, he backs it up with a scripture right after it. And that's a man who had three different fatal diseases when he was 17. The doctor said he ain't going to make it. And he was miraculously healed. And he wasn't healed miraculously by Satan or the devil. And, and the devil wouldn't have tried to kill him off if he wasn't important to the Christian realm. So anyways, but I didn't seek God about, should I do this, this good move? And, you know, and even if you disagree with the people you're with, uh, there's compromise. And uh, for the sake of where you have to go, what you got to do, and the path you're on with God, and uh, which was I could see the wisdom of getting the four-year degree at that college to get credentials just so if I wanted to blow off the denomination start my own independent church I could at least say I'm officially in the eyes of man trained by man here's my little piece of paper I attended the classes but I disagree with some of what they have to say. That's why I'm now 501c3 non-denominational independent church. Because I believe the Bible. <laughs> and the, it, once again, let me emphasize, the Lutheran Church in America, president of the synod and their board, sat with me at a table for an hour or two. One day back in, I guess it was 82 or something like that because I was going to transfer colleges and I wanted their scholarship and I was on a path then supposedly thinking going to a Lutheran seminary <clears throat> and they approved me the president of the denomination uh, the president of the synod in the northeastern Pennsylvania in the Lutheran Church in America back in the mid 80s early 80s I think his name was Jan Walker I think they called them bishops back then or now Bishop Jan Walker and he one-on-one -on -one met with me. They, they had their little interview session, and then I went home. 
and they called me back to uh, for a uh, post conference about what they had decided a couple weeks later I think and he said to me I remember this pretty clearly he said you know when you came over to us we were going to just blow you out of the water and we were positive this was not going to work but every question that we asked you you had a good answer for and we just can't disagree with anything that you said and they said so we we're approving you <laughs> and you're going to be a radical one so we're going to stick you in some church like Morristown <laughs> which was outside of Nazareth PA and where my dad's church had been and uh, it was a good sized church it wasn't a little church it was a big building in a small town you know they held a few hundred people they, I don't know how many members they had but you know uh, it was a going church so they weren't slapping me in the face and said saying we're gonna stick you in the middle of nowhere they were just saying oh well we hope this works good luck <laughs> you know so uh, I was approved by a major denomination to enter into ministry and it's just that I didn't go through their four-year school down in Philadelphia I knew exactly what it was going to be it would have been almost like a parallel to southeastern in Florida only without the spirit filled stuff it would have been more Martin Luther history and more Greek and more Hebrew classes and believe me in college if you think you can learn enough Hebrew and Greek from going to classes in seminary to be able to read the Bible in their original languages let me just put this to you did you have foreign languages in high school what did you have three years and maybe went on to college had another year of that foreign language German or French or Spanish okay how's your German or French or Spanish today can you go to Germany or France or Spain and hold a good fluent conversation with a native okay and that was four years I had three years of Latin and four years of German and I can't speak Latin and I can't speak German I can recognize some words here or there, especially the unimportant ones. You know, uh, I think in Latin, luxus is light. <laughs> and in German, uh, let me see, wiener schnitzel. No, <laughs> I'm kidding. Uh, the verbs, some of the little verbs that are common and some of the nouns that are common, you recognize. But, but as far as important nouns and verbs that carry on. So what I'm saying is, it's hoop jumping. You know, when you when a man is put into a denomination, they basically just have him in there for four years to see what kind of a person is this guy? Can we live with this guy? Is this guy for real? Or do we have to throw this guy to the, the road, you know? And uh, because, believe me, the Greek and Hebrew that your pastor studied when they were in seminary is, they ain't going to go out and translate a, <laughs> a new translation of the Bible from what they learned. Maybe if they were taking it maybe if they grew up in Israel and spoke Hebrew or or uh, Greek okay if they were in Greece and spoke the native language for 10 20 years okay you know maybe they can and then you have to know the other language you know what are you going to translate it into you know like Martin Luther took the Latin uh, the Catholic Church Latin Bible and translated it over I think it was the Latin Vulgate and translated it into German language of the people for I think that was the first time in history that the Bible the Word of God was translated into a native tongue the regular people could read and understand but our our message here is seek God and for important decisions in life what, what do I do okay you would think that if anybody would know to pray to God and say what should I do thinking of making a huge choice here you know determines what I'm gonna do for a living and under whose auspices and where and I was just humanly thinking ain't no way I'm gonna get along with the assembly of God these guys and I they're making warfare on my on my beliefs and my people and the people that I've brought me here in the first place that I've read their books in you know all the I bet you I had a hundred Kenneth Hagin books and, uh, and uh, I don't know how many Kenneth Copeland books and tapes I had. And of course, as you move around, and if your family is at war with your beliefs, 
my family having been Lutheran, my dad a Lutheran minister, uh, don't be surprised if a lot of your stuff, class notes, books, and your books from famous, uh, you know, <coughs> theological people, Hagen and Copeland, don't be surprised if they wind up in the dumpster or the bonfire when you move and you're out of state for a few months. Uh, once again, thank you, my older brothers, uh, my mother, and to a degree, my father, who obviously wasn't watching out for my best interests when he retired in 1983 and moved to Florida. And all the stuff that was stored in the attic of our house that I was in when we were growing up was moved. And I was already in Florida in 1980 to go to college at Southeastern. And, you know, when they were moving a thousand miles away and I was down there, they weren't interested in packing up my stuff and carefully taking care of it and transporting it across the country. So, and they didn't tell me, we're moving, all your stuff has to go somewhere. If you want to come up here and get it or do something with it, you know. Well, okay, I'll stuff it in my dorm room. How's that? It, so it was a very bad situation. They didn't agree with my beliefs. Uh, they were moving. Uh, I was in a college a thousand miles away from them. They could do anything they want to with my stuff. And the devils played that hand extremely well. You know, when I'm in Pennsylvania, he screws with my stuff in Florida. And he did that. And when I was in Florida, they screwed with my stuff in Pennsylvania. And they did that. So they basically wiped out a lot of my stuff that belonged to me that I had painfully collected over the years. Uh, not not just theologically and, and Christianity and concerning the Bible, but comic books, car magazines, mad magazines, pictures, photo albums, girlfriends growing up, uh, you know, pewter mugs I had gotten for gifts from girlfriends in college, you know, at fraternities, all gone. No idea what happened to them, where they went. I didn't throw them out, you know, but... Uh, family. Uh, and, and this was a Lutheran family I grew up in. My father was a Lutheran minister of a large Lutheran church. And my two brothers are supposed to be Christian, especially the one who started churches. And my mother, a Christian minister's, Lutheran minister's wife. And all this, does, you know, all this from disagreement about theological background, disagreement with, uh, what your beliefs are in Christ and in Christianity. It can happen to you, my friend. Uh, believe me. And, you know, so this is why you have to seek God and find out what he wants you to do to protect you. You know, and if I had been established and had my own parsonage and was a pastor. See, my dad was old when they had me, and so was my mother. <clears throat> and uh, they were near retirement when I was just going off to college. And uh, if it would have been like, you know, if they would have been in their 40s when I went off to college, like in normal families, they'd still had another 20 years in that my boyhood home before they would retire. So all my stuff would be safe until I was established. But my brothers being a lot older than me, you know, they were already established in, in their own houses, in their own apartments. So, um, what I'm saying to you is my thesis today that I'm trying to get across in an extremely awkward, wordy way, which I apologize for. All you can do is all you can do, but all you can do is what you got. And uh, my thesis is talk to God about your major life decisions. And the reason I'm telling you that is because nobody told me to do that when I was growing up. In the Lutheran church, in my house growing up, uh, I was told, well, you know, reason and think about what you want to do and choose something in your own mind. And <clears throat> never, never, a, well, why don't you go on a fast and seek God? Why don't you put it up before the Lord and ask him for your choice of your path and what his, his way for you to go? They, they would have thought you were nuts if you said something like that to them. Because they, they didn't believe, my family didn't believe in asking and hearing God, you know, listening for God or praying to him about advice or wisdom for what to do. Even though the Bible says that, you know, David and Psalms, James, uh, talking about, you don't know what to do, you need wisdom, ask God. He, he'll tell you. 
I didn't get that, you know. And even after you get into the assemblies of God, I guess they handle that like, well, everybody knows that, you know. Nobody makes a major life decision without the Lord. But, you know, how did you make up, how does the world make their mind up? Uh, well, they, they use their own rational human thinking. What do I like? What do I feel like doing? What do I want to do? That's how the world makes their choices. And that's how they don't seek God. And that's how they make their, you know. <sighs> I was raised in a household and given to think that, well, you know, your birth is kind of an accident. You know, you're put there on this earth because man and a woman came together and bang sperm and an egg met and uh, another human born and what do you want to do well you'll just know you know do something anything doesn't matter what you do just get a job you know <laughs> sorry but that's most of the world most of the Christian world uh, teaches something exactly like that you know they leave God out of the major decisions. Why would you bug him? He's got billions of beings to run all over the universe. And he's very, very busy. You know, how do you think you're going to... You think he's going to stop what he's doing? Come to see you and tell you what to do? <laughs> oh, you <laughs> of, of much faith. Uh, <clears throat> so, that's how you find yourself at the other end of life. Going, gee, I wonder what I should do when I grow up. <laughs> and meanwhile, your family has been burning your house down and shooting the bottom of your existence out from underneath you without remorse. And they think they're really good Christian people because they have their names on little brass plaques in churches and they give money and they attend services and they live like the devil. <laughs> Literally. They don't think they live like the devil because they don't swear. They don't raise their voice or get angry. But they steal from people. They kill people's lives. They destroy people's lives <clears throat> just by the, the way they live their life. And it's legal. We allow it in America. It's okay. It's okay to run in there and, you know, just uh, uh, sneak around and do legal things against relatives just because you can. You, you're rich. you got lawyers. You can... Uh, you can absolutely kill off your youngest brother if you want to. Uh, he's been floundering around trying to find out God's will for his life. Now that he's discovered real Christianity. You know. And uh, so much I want to say. So much to say. Suffice it to say I'm trying to tell you it's extremely important for your major decisions in life. And if you want to get it into your minor decisions in life also, ask God what he thinks. Ask the Holy Spirit what you should do. Seek the Lord. If you can find it in the Bible, that's his will. God is not going to come apart from what he's saying in the Bible. If God says something in the New Testament, if Jesus said something in the New Testament, or Paul saying something in the New Testament, that's his will. You don't have to ask him again if exactly what you're praying about is already written in black and white in one of the translations of the Bible. That's pretty much his last word because the word is Jesus' own word said, Jesus said in the New Testament, he said, heaven and earth will pass away, but my words will never pass away. Meaning they're unbreakable, they can't be destroyed. So, <clears throat> You know what? I don't know if there's ever going to be another another Shepherd's Voice video again. The Shepherd's Voice, which, by the way, was uh, my one uh, unsolicited bit of guidance and wisdom from Jesus Christ was when he showed up at my dorm room in April of 1982 in late afternoon. And there was three classmates there in the room with me they did not hear him and he said to me not the preppy times the shepherd's voice specifically I knew exactly what the meaning of that was because of events that had taken place before in that year and in my mind etc and uh, I, I've started this thing and I suppose if I would have stayed at Southeastern, got my credentials, divorced myself from the Assembly of God, gone independent, non-denominational, 
things might have worked out, calling myself the Shepherd's Voice, Shepherd's Voice Ministries, Shepherd's Voice Church. But, uh, you know, here we are. And uh, I'm just telling you for your own sake. When you come to major decisions in life, only God knows the future. And only he knows how he built you and screwed you together. Only God the Father and the Holy Spirit of God. <clears throat> Jesus knows a lot about you. Knows where you should be, what you should be doing, what will prosper and profit you and make you happy. Being in the center of God's will. Obviously, if you're doing what you were built and designed for, what you have abilities for, what you have passions in, that's God's will for you, you know, and you enjoy yourself and you're prospering at it. Uh, if if you pick out a person to marry and life is basically much better off with them than your life was without them, it's probably God's will. Or at the very least, God is blessing your your choice and your union. Uh, if you wake up every morning and go, oh, no, <laughs> another day with the she-devil, another day <laughs> with, you know, battling it out with Satan's spawn, <laughs> probably wasn't God's choice for you. And uh, as far as your eternal destiny, you know, get that one right. If you blow everything else and and don't know to seek God and don't go after his will at least choose God and choose eternity read the Bible believe what's inside of that follow it the best you can I don't care what your pastor is saying from the pulpit or what your your babysitter used to tell you growing up or what your nanny and your grandma used to tell you or what your parents pet peeves are about sermons and pastors and denominations or what they're telling you if it doesn't line up with the Bible, chuck it. You know, if it disagrees with what the Bible's saying, they're wrong. <laughs> Bible's not wrong, they're wrong. They'll at least get that one right. If you blow everything in else, else in life, at least choose Jesus. Read the Word of God. Pray daily if you can. Uh, get in your time of praise and worship somehow. Get some artists that you like to listen to. And put them in your CD player or M whatever, your MPEG thing or iPod. <clears throat> and uh, your praise and worship, your prayer. And read the Word. When you're reading the, the Word of God and the Bible, you are washing yourself in the water of the Word. You are refreshing yourself with the second part of the Trinity. The incarnate Word of God, Jesus Christ, and His words are in you and live in you if my words abide in you and you abide in me you shall ask whatever you want and I'll do it for you how, how much better can it get than that <clears throat> so stay safe be blessed uh, remember God remember to always go before your heavenly father in all of your major life decisions and as many as for your minor life decisions as you can remember to think about him in Go to seek God and ask him in prayer, what should I do about this or that? And uh, wait on him for an answer. He'll come somehow to you. He'll show you in the word. A friend will come by and a word will resonate within you. Or uh, you'll hear a preacher on TV. Or uh, just you'll, there'll be a knowing. Or get quiet before him. Just, just, just sit on your back porch and rock and watch the sunset. And, and just be still and be God inside minded and listen to for what brings the peace into your spirit and in your inner mind and your inner person you know what uh, the stuff that you think about it and you get this turmoil in your gut and it's not you not peaceful about it at all not God that's the Holy Spirit saying no no fear from that you don't want to do that okay so you know Anybody who's a really good theological Christian pastor will go over everything I've said here right now. So impromptu, so off the cuff, so casually. They say, you know what, there's scriptures behind everything he said. Everything he said, he's absolutely right. And, you know, you go with the word of God. God's word is eternal. Follow the Bible. Follow the leading of the word of God. You want to know the will of God? Read the Bible. 
Uh, you want to do the Word of God, do the Bible. <laughs> do what's in there. Stuff that's not covered by the Bible, pray about it. Get a piece about what the answer is. Um, you know, if if things are now in an uproar and you're at the edge in a number of areas, uh, you can, in that state of time, in that your current state of affairs in your life, seek God now probably more important than before you made a bad decision and say God what do I do what okay now I'm in here I've got myself into this I mentally chose this by my own wisdom what do I do obviously I'm not in a position that you want me to be in uh, what's happening to me is nothing to do with your kingdom or your will for my life what do I do about this, this now, now? And it's incredibly important for you to seek him and listen in times like that. And then, uh, <clears throat> you know, if you know Christian people who believe in approaching God for wisdom and direction in your life and what you do, that this would be a good time for you to contact them and ask them to keep you in their prayers and say, God, help them, you know, uh, and, and say to them, uh, would you help me out um, in a critical decision point concerning such and such in my life? And I need God's wisdom concerning what to do because I don't know what to do. And forever, these following phrases that you've heard many times from the world and growing up and from parents and stuff and grandparents, please take these phrases and throw them out forever and never again pin any of your wisdom of life of choices and what to do on these stupid counsel remarks from people phrases such as oh you'll just know <laughs> when the one comes you'll just know oh what's love oh it's you know uh, i can't describe what it is but but when you fall into it you'll know uh which is what should i do well anything <laughs> What should I do for a living for the rest of my life as a vocation? What college should I go to? Well, whatever one you can get into. You know, can you get scholarships? What's the cheapest college? That's probably the place to go. You know, all this stuff out of human wives' tales, human wisdom, that's garbage that will shipwreck you. Um, you know, fortunately, sometimes people hook up with people who are wise for mates, and they can steer them in the right directions. Or maybe they just inherently had something in their mind that they're capable of doing, that they enjoy doing from from their boyhood, and they go after that. And they're in good shape. You know, and you people who've never found your home country, who are out there paddling in the water, going, boy, I hope I get land soon, because otherwise I'm going to starve to death out here in the open ocean. <laughs> uh, I hear you. <laughs> and, uh, okay, you know what? We're going to play... Uh, the outro and I I think uh, post office box 325 is still working I think my emails up there you want to contact me you got problems you want to talk further get a hold of me I'm not sure how long I've been talking but let's uh, roll this thing <laughs> 